Welcome to the Armed Guardian Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Brian, here with David and Crystal, our co-host. Today, we've got guest Clint Macro with us. Uh, he's going to talk to us about National Train a Teacher uh, Day that's coming up this June. How are you doing today, Clint? I'm doing quite fine. Thank you for having me on the show. It's, it's an honor to be on your podcast. Thank you, sir. Uh, I've been really blessed since uh, I started this August of last year, and uh, I've had some great people. Of course, you're cohort uh, in crime uh, <laughs> matt uh he's he's done the saber pepper spray i took the instructor class with him uh two years ago and mm -hmm. uh he's we've been in contact and getting ready to do another class and a utm class uh back down here in southeast georgia so uh looking forward to connecting with him again i, w I wish i could have went out to shot show but it just didn't, what, didn't work out this year for me yeah shot shows are, have you been to shot show before I haven't, and I've, okay. I've been wanting to. Well, here's here's the best advice I can give on SHOT Show. Just okay. go into it knowing there's no possible way to see everything. And then you just kind of pick pick your battles, so to speak, and then just focus on that. And try not to be drawn by all the lights and flashy things. Because if you do, you'll get distracted <laughs> and time will kill you. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Well, um, got a few questions here for you. As, like I said, since we are talking about the National Train of Teacher Day, uh, something that once I heard you uh, last year when I signed up for it, uh, something that really piqued my interest and in, uh, with the events that have happened in the public with the schools and education and uh, places, uh, it's something that I've really felt drawn to try to bring awareness and, and educate the educators uh, mm -hmm. to be able to save them or not save themselves, but to act and to act appropriately in a situation, maybe even help curtail one. So, um, sure. well, uh, for those that don't know who Clint Macro is, uh, give us a little bit of a bio if you can, please, sir. Well, it, it started uh, on a late Tuesday night when my mother was at an Elvis concert. That's when I was conceived. I'm, I'm kidding about that, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I've, I've been actually uh, in the, the training industry for a number of years now. Uh, I started my company, the Trigger Pressers Union, back in 2013. Prior to that, I was doing classes as just Clint, the instructor. Uh, my background, as you can see here, is in the recording industry, and I've been doing that since I was a kid. But uh, I was out in Los Angeles for a number of years working in that industry, and my best friend was an armor. So he would take actors to the range and show them how to use the guns, and he'd blank adapt them and do the things that he did on, on sets to run the set properly. Well, he'd say, hey, you want to come to the range? I'm like, okay, cool. So I've always been a shooter. I've been, a matter of fact, I grew up in central Pennsylvania, up in the woods. Okay. Some people refer to it as Pennsylvania to give you an idea of what the, <laughs> what the uh, terrain and the, and the population is like. But I, I don't even remember getting a gun. I've always had one. Like it's something that I've had as a child, going back to a BB gun in my first 22. And so firearms have always been a part of my my life. And so went to the range with my my best friend and he'd say, hey, help me teach this actor. And he'd bring a girlfriend, help me teach her. And so I started doing that and, and I had a knack for it. And he says, hey, you should be an instructor. I'm like, well, how do I do that? I'm not military or law enforcement, you know. I always thought you had to be one of those to, to be an instructor. And he's like, oh, absolutely not. He says, here, and he introduced me to the NRA programs. And I met an NRA training counselor out there who was also a recording engineer in his day job. So we really hit it off. And uh, I got certified in pistol and rifle and, and I think personal protection mm -hmm. and uh, helped him on a couple classes. And, you know, like so many instructors, I wore the patch and said that I was an instructor and I'd help people at the range now and then. But I wasn't teaching the, the classes properly, you know, as designed by the NRA. And I came to Pittsburgh after my son was born and we moved back home, my wife and I, and I found a sportsman's club before I bought the house so I could train and I drew a circle around the club and bought a house in the circle. And long story short, I got involved as a volunteer at the range. We were putting on a, a lot of uh, uh, NRA basic pistol, like the proper eight hour long form classes and a few other things we were doing too. And so I got a lot of time working that, uh, I worked with a lot of people that had arthritis and wheelchairs and missing limbs and, and Parkinson's and all kinds of stuff. It was a great opportunity for me as a, as an educator to learn how to work with people and adapt techniques to suit their individual needs. Anyhow, was doing that, teaching my own stuff. I ended up becoming a, uh, had the opportunity to become a training counselor through NRA. I started the Trigger Pressers Union in 13. That's the same time I found the USCCA's curriculum. I joined the USCCA, I think in 2013. 
Uh, it's the same year I found Rob Pincus and I said, hey, this stuff makes a lot of sense to me. And I contacted him and said, hey, I'll host you and bring you out and fill your classes up for you. And so that 13 was really when things took off big. And I kind of, I always say this when I talk to folks, like I, I believe, uh, I don't know your, your religious proclivities or whatever, but I believe that God puts doors in front of you. And sometimes we just walk right past them. Sometimes we kind of poke our nose and look and go, go past them. Sometimes we cautiously stick our toe in. And other times he goes, boom, and he pushes you right through the door. And I think this was a situation that pushed me through the door because my, my professional life was always in the audio industry. And now here I am where my audio business, you know, makes me cigarette money, so to speak. I don't smoke, but, you know, a little, little extra money here and there. And I've dedicated my whole entire life to uh, training my fellow Americans and, and helping empower them to be their own family first responders. And, um, I, you know, I'm not going to say it's like George W. Bush saying God told me to do it, but I think there's a, a righteous calling there. And I think that's why so many of us do what we do. We want to help people out. And uh, so that's the background on me. Uh, National Train of Teacher Day came about 2018 after uh, Parkland. And, uh, you know, at that time, things were looked at very differently. You know, we've come a long way in the seven years since we started National Train of Teacher Day as far as the mindset and the idea of taking proactive measures to protect people in schools and, and that. However, there's still a lot of room to, to go here. But uh, at the time, we're watching it unfold on TV. I'm sure you guys remember seeing what was happening down at Parkland and the amount of time it took for people to get in there. And then the cop didn't go in. He went back out, you know, the sheriff and, and, and all the controversy that surrounded that. Right. I got a call from Grant Gallagher. He's a training counselor from New Jersey. Uh, I'd worked with Grant down at NRA headquarters a number of times. He's a friend and a colleague. And he says, we got to do something. And if you know Grant, you know it sounded like Scrooge McDuck because he's got this Scottish <laughs> accent. But he says, we got to do something. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He says, we need to train teachers. I said, well, don't you already do that? And he says, well, yeah. I said, everyone I know does that. He says, yeah, but we need to do it as a, as a grassroots movement, as a unified front to show the world that we are actually doing something about it. I'm like, hey, that's a great idea. And he says, we should call it uh, National Train of Teacher Day. And I said, I'm on it. And by the end of the weekend, I had the website up. Uh, the first year we had about a two month lead time. So there wasn't a ton of time to get people involved, but we got a couple hundred instructors in most of the States. We were in over half the States that first year mm -hmm. and we offered training. And then of course, each year it's grown and built. And here we are at the seventh year and we're going to observe the seventh uh, national train of teacher day on June 22nd of this year. That'll be the, the fourth Saturday of the month, June 22nd. Okay. All right. Sounds great. I'm looking forward to, being involved in that this year. So you, you kind of already uh, touched on our, the first question, which was uh, what is National Train of Teacher Day and how did it get started? So anything anything else you wanted to add on that? Uh, yeah. Are you guys yeah. are you I wanna, in all 50 states uh, this, this year? No, I'm not in all 50. I got to double check. I think Vermont, there's Vermont and one other one that I'm not in. Or okay. I say I'm not, you know, the, the movement isn't. So um, okay. I, I will, I'm going to send out the press kit actually after I'm done with this interview and in there I will list the two states that we don't have it and we'll see if we can maybe get folks to sign up. Okay. We've got folks in Hawaii this year. We've got folks in, in uh, Alaska. So I'm, I am just missing two states, I believe. Maybe it's one okay. state. I'd love to be able to say we're in all 50 and the territories. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so one thing I think it's, that people need to be very clear on uh, instructors and anyone else that's considering getting involved with it or, or partaking in the training or just who's sitting by the wayside listening to this mm -hmm. national train of teacher day is not about guns, right? Guns are just, or firearms are really just one potential uh, defensive tool that could be a solution to deal with evil once it has crossed the threshold. Right. But uh, this is, we are absolutely not in favor of an armed teacher program. However, individuals who exercise their rights outside of school shouldn't be barred from exercising their right in school just because of where they work. So, you know, looking at eliminating gun-free zones, um, you know, empowering teachers, school staff, administrators, anyone that work with youth in a leadership capacity that work inside that building, if it's legal to do so, to be able to get them to be able to carry a gun if they choose to do so. And I think that's, that's important. Like, why would you not allow someone to protect themselves and those that they love just because they work in a particular building. So I, I think that's something that obviously is a school issue in a lot of schools, but also other places too. You know, if, if 
Someone can protect themselves and their family at the playground, at the park, on the street, at Walmart, in their home. Why shouldn't they continue to be able to do that when they're, you know, at school? Especially right. if the school is funded by government money, which makes it a public entity. I totally protect personal property rights. So if I come to your house and you say, hey, Clint, take your shoes off, like, oh, okay. You know, I don't have to come in your house if I don't want to take my shoes off. So public property is a different thing. But our schools are all funded by the government, run by the government. And the Second Amendment shouldn't stop when we go to school. Right. So that's that's something that I think, uh, you know, an armed and educated teacher is more is a much better advocate for that kind of change than I can be. But that's also part of it, too, to expand, uh, you know, our rights and liberties, because ultimately it's all about protecting the kids. Right. That's all that matters. And and the one thing I'm pushing this year really hard just to try to bring in some people that maybe aren't into the whole firearms thing is, look, deterrence is always a better option than meeting that meeting that attacker with a physical force. Right. So what can we do to deter that? You know, get rid of the gun free zone signs. That's a that's a big deterrence to get rid of that sign, because the sign is not a deterrence. The sign is a welcome mat. Yeah. You know, if you have resource officers in the school or if, or if you are in a state where the teachers can arm themselves let people know that yeah. say yes we do have adults in this building that could meet you know could meet evil with force to stop them i think that's important yeah. because bad guys are less likely to go in somewhere where they think they could get you know get met with some type of deadly force so those are two very good things that you know locking doors uh, you know, how many times have you been to a school like to, for, a, you know, to vote or for, a you know, if you guys have kids like, a, you know, I was always the dad that would bring cups and 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 cookies and stuff to the Christmas party. You'll see doors that are like blocked open and there's a brick and it's not locked. Yeah. It's like, guys, lock the doors. Like there's so many things that can be done just from a mindset stand, standpoint that could protect our, mm -hmm. our children. Can I just ask something the way you just said about the doors locking? Yeah. So I used to live five minutes from Parkland, the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. My house was right there. That was the school my son was going to go to. So I was heavily involved in all this when this was going on. Prior to this, I had told many of the people that I would teach their children free active shooter prevention and preparedness. And I was just shunt. They said, well, it's never going to happen here. We're a fluent area. Don't worry about it. So that went that way. Well, the day of the shooting, I was getting so many calls. It's mm -hmm. too late to plan now, right? So we were doing a suicide awareness class, mm -hmm. a training, and Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was going to allow us to do it there, but then they changed their minds. So we did it at the uh, middle school next door. Do you know when I went in there, those doors didn't lock either? And I asked, how come they have not done anything to secure these doors? And they said it was too expensive. <laughs> and like yeah. after their neighbor just had that incident, and I'm like, really? I was really shocked that that was the answer. It was just well, too much. That's the financial aspect is all is is often an answer. And it's it's even our individual students that we train as as uh, you know defensive instructors, people misallocate their defensive financial resources like all the time. So, you know, you'll have a school that will spend a million dollars or more on putting fake astroturf on the football field. Oh, yeah. But they won't throw down a couple a couple 10, 20 grand on just putting deadbolts in all the doors. Like that's mm -hmm. that's a very misguided way to look at things. And you they know, do and, fundraisers for sports all the time, right? They yeah. do all kinds of fundraisers. Like, why can't you fundraise for something that's really important? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, the, the one thing I will say, I, I do know that the, you know, the government, not that I ever look to the government for a solution, the government has freed up money and things to mm -hmm. help with schools, you know, whether that be at the state or federal level. So there is assistance out there for people that are looking for it. But I can say our school district here where I live, uh, they've they've really taken great leaps and bounds at protecting the children and, and hardening the school and and having resource officers in, in the building and, you know, putting bulletproof glass at the entryway. And there, there was a lot of things that they did and even even incorporated training to where they were you know, teaching the kids on what to do if something like that were to occur so that folks had at least a plan in mind. You know, it's it's like even a, a I'll use the term, even a half-assed plan is better than no plan whatsoever, yeah. right? And when we say, oh, it's not going to happen here. Oh, we're too affluent. Oh, never mind. It's too unpleasant to talk about. That's where people really, really get, get surprised. So I, I think it's important and prudent to think about the worst case scenario. What is the worst thing that could happen here? And let's come up with an idea to deal with it. And I, I think we should approach all of our defensive training that way. 
let's train and let's plan for the worst case scenario for where everything goes sideways. And if we can have a plan that works or if we can start to develop skills and infrastructure that works in that context, then I think it's prudent to assume that you're going to be a little bit better off if you have a heads up or you'll be maybe a little better prepared if you see it coming. And, you know, that's I think that's how we should approach our defensive strategy, no matter what, whether it's in the school or, you know, in your home. Right. OK. Um, since uh, since it's grown uh, or how has it grown since its inception? Uh, I know you said that first uh, the first year it was a, a late start, basically. Uh, how over the time uh, each year, how has the uh, program grown uh, and uh, to the number of instructors are? classes that are being taught by these instructors? Yeah, each each year I've had significant growth in the uh, volunteer uh, cadre. So we, uh, I think we added, uh, I think I'm, I'm not going to give you numbers here that I would like say in court, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, we had, we had a little over 300 the first year when we just had a couple months to roll it out. We had about 300 people volunteer for that. And actually, I have to give credit where credit credit is due. A lot of that was because of uh, Carrie Lightfoot, you know, from the Well Armed Woman. She she was uh, she sent out some email blasts. She didn't do anything publicly because at the time I think she was on NRA board and wanted to kind of stay away from potential controversy. But right. uh, she sent emails out to all of her cadre and and said, "Look, you need to help Clinton. We need volunteers." And 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 so we got a lot of people through her efforts. Uh, the second year, I know we added another 150 people. And each year, I'll just ballpark. I know we add about 50 instructors per year that volunteer. Uh, and, you know, as far as the amount of classes that are being taught, uh, I'll be honest, you know, as someone that just kind of started this and threw up a website and was encouraged people to, to join, originally, we wanted complete anonymity. So at the, at the beginning, I didn't even, it's, we didn't want to know people's names and whatever. So if you were working with some teachers in your, in your area, you built a relationship with them. They were taking the class, but I didn't want to know that information because I wanted to, you know, give the the, the teachers and the the participants complete anonymity. But I missed out on an opportunity there to get data. And so, you know, like you're asking me this question, and for the first couple of years, like I, I don't really have any data. Okay. Um, but last year, I started asking for people, uh, the instructors, to start sending me after action reports, and I'm asking that again this year. And and even then, it's it's anonymity. So, you know, you're letting me know, okay, I had three high school teachers, a janitor, uh, a preacher, a rabbi, and uh, a, a lunch lady. And they took a NRA basic pistol course or a USCCA, you know, a mini class or a, you know, a, a defensive shooting fundamental course or a pepper spray or a first aid. And that's kind of the, the information that I'm trying to, to gather now. But I can say, with full confidence that we've affected the lives of thousands of teachers throughout the United States through this effort. Okay. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's great. And you kind of mentioned some of the uh, organizations, but uh, what uh, organizations are participating in this uh, growing event? Uh, I know you've mentioned the USCCA and the SABER and uh, what other uh, organizations are, are sponsors of the, the program official sponsors the united states concealed carry association the uscca mm -hmm. and uh, saber pepper spray saber red uh they're they've been official partners since the actually the second time we did it second year uh they came on as as uh sponsors and basically what that means is they've they've both helped me with a little bit on the national front as far as uh, uh you know spreading awareness and and some publicity uh, I know uh, Tim's done a couple email blasts, uh, Tim Schmidt from uh, USCCA talking about National Trainer Teacher Day. And so we've gotten a little bit of a uh, national push from those those uh, companies and organizations. But what they're pledging is that if you are, say, for instance, a USCCA instructor and you would like to supply textbooks to your students on National Trainer Teacher Day, then they'll send you textbooks for free. Uh, if you're a saber pepper spray instructor, then they'll send you the student kits, the little, the, you know, the, the white boxes with the inner units in the, in the textbook. So any instructor that's certified to teach a class through those organizations and they have an active certification and they submit a roster beforehand, um, they can get the uh, materials mailed out to them for, for no cost. Okay. So that helps to defer the cost of the, uh, of the training. Cause 
the training is supposed to be free. So, you know, there's been a lot of instructors that heck the first second year I did it, I paid out of my pocket for the range and um, bought my own books that I was giving them. So I had, a, you know, I had quite a bit of money tied up in it. A lot of instructors do the same. Right. Luckily, a lot of the ranges and a lot of the places that are offering, you know, classrooms and things like they're also donating. So for all of you instructors out there working locally, if your range donates the range, or if you have the local local restaurant bringing food for everybody, make sure you're promoting them right. uh, to your participants, because this is a, it's kind of a, it's not just instructors that have been volunteering their time, effort, and energy. There's been a lot of auxiliary people and support folks that have been giving their time too. Okay. When do you usually start advertising for this? Well, that's been kind of sporadic, honestly, because it's just me running it. Uh, okay. when the first couple of years, Grant Gallagher and I both ran it together. Uh, Grant was uh, the co-founder, uh, but because of some various uh, things going on personally, he was he had to step back from from the uh, the duty of doing that. So I've been running it myself, I think now for three years, maybe four years, three years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll be honest, <laughs> it's been a little sporadic. Uh, okay. This year for the seventh annual, I announced the date right after, like the day after we did it last year. So I wanted to make sure everyone had the date. In years past, I would kind of wait for that till New Year's and then I'd give the date and, and people are like, why didn't you just tell us that like two months earlier? So um, I put out the official news release like video. I always do a video introduction. I did that, I think, over Christmas time that came out. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, it's uh, when I send out the promo kit to all you guys, you're going to see. Um, we've been doing it the last couple of years since the lockdown on the third weekend or the third Saturday of June. That just seemed, June seemed to be the sweet deal for everybody. The first year we did it in May before school was out. One year we did it in August, you know, it was deeper into the, into uh, the summertime. Right. Everyone seems that the best time is in that June. Now, of course, <laughs> there's no way to please everybody. Right. Oh, of course. But, but that June, June seemed to be the best. So we were doing the third Saturday this year. We're doing the fourth Saturday because I had about five instructors reach out to me and say, hey, I think we should really try it for these reasons. Okay. So we're going to try it out. And then I'm going to do a, a vote with all the volunteers. And then moving forward, we're either going to be doing the third or the first Saturday uh, for the third or the fourth Saturday of June. And that will be like the official date, whatever date that is. It'd be the third or the fourth Saturday. All right. So, Clint. Um, yes, sir. And you kind of already alluded to this. It's not all about the firearms training. Also, Saber Red um, helps out. But what topics are the most covered by um, instructors? Sorry, say that again. What topics what, are? What topics are most covered by instructors? Most covered? I, you know, I would say probably gun stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of the instructors that volunteer are NRA basic pistol instructors, they're USCC instructors that teach concealed carry and things like that. So I would say probably gun related stuff is th what you see most offered. Uh, with that said, uh, I think everybody, and I'm going to say this to everybody, everybody that teaches a class, whatever it is, they should go over how to use a tourniquet. I think everyone should do that. And if you're not comfortable talking about that as an instructor, then I recommend you get certified to teach people how to use a tourniquet. That's definitely something that I think all defensive instructors should talk about. You know, it doesn't I have agree. to be a, it doesn't have to be a full on medical course, but a monkey can be shown how to use a tourniquet, and with a couple couple bits of instruction, they can put one on. So I, I think that's everything that everybody should be teaching that in their National Training Teacher Day classes. The other thing that everyone should be talking about is even if they're not teaching gun stuff, they should know that when the gun goes locks to the back like that, the gun can't go bang anymore. Right. And if everybody in, in a school understands that when the slidey thing locks back, the gun can't go bang for a moment, that's important for people to know. Right. So even if you're not teaching gun stuff, make sure people understand that. The other thing is too, folks need to understand that, that, everybody can do something to make their their school safer mm -hmm. something you know you don't have to put a gun on you know that may not be allowed by law you know maybe having something else in your room that you could use as a as an alternative defensive device like a baseball bat okay that's smart knowing how to break a window out so you can get the kids out of the classroom into the courtyard that might be something good to know about knowing how to lock the door if there isn't a lock on the door you know, knowing how to put the kids against the wall so someone can't look in the door and see that the room is, is full of people. Right. You know, there's so many little things that someone can do that will help make that classroom 
safer or less attractive to that bad guy. And I, I think once people do one thing, then it leads to another and then another and then another. But as I said before, we are not condoning or advocating for, I guess is a better word, for a an armed teacher program. Right. That's not what we're looking to do here. Uh, and, you know, if, if that were the case, then the government would get involved. And quite frankly, when the government gets involved, that's when things, frankly, don't work nearly as well, in my opinion. So we want to empower the individual to be able to exercise their rights and protect themselves and those that they love. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's all about prevention. Yeah. yeah. I know one of the big pushes I do is, uh, to me, it seems like first aid is the the forgotten art uh, when it comes to firearms, and it's something that I'm really been advocating for here lately, and uh, something that uh, I'm looking to try to do, probably not this year uh, with National Train the Teacher Day, but probably next year. Uh, this year, I'm looking at doing a pepper, the Saber pepper spray and uh, countering a mat, how to identify a public threat mm -hmm. uh, for my two classes. And uh, David was going to do um, situational awareness and violent encounters uh, on for his two classes that are the locations we're going to do it on this year. But uh, yeah, first aid for me is the that forgotten art. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't think about it until they need it and then they don't know how to react or how to take care of a situation so that's what i'm hoping to do is empower some people in in that avenue well i think it's very important to recognize for us as instructors but also for the people who might be taking part of this program if something horrible like that happens in your school mm -hmm. police are minutes away when seconds account fine but even when police get there, it's still going to be multiple minutes before someone is available to put a bandage on you or a tourniquet on you. They will step over your body while you're bleeding out to go stop the bad guy. That's what they're there to do. They have to make the scene safe first. Right. So it is absolutely on us, the civilians, the teachers, the, the school staff, to be able to throw a bandage on someone, to throw a tourniquet on someone, because that's just the reality of things. You know, if something were to occur, you're going to need to put some type of bandage on someone. Like that's almost guaranteed if someone actually is there doing violence with some type of, you know, offensive weapon. So that's a good reason to do it. But as defensive instructors too, just take it outside of National Trainer Teacher Day. I'll have some instructors who teach concealed carry or, you know, using a firearm to defend people in the home, those kind of classes. And they're sheepish about teaching people how to use a tourniquet. And... I, I actually had an instructor one time, uh, you know, I, I talk about my emergency procedure and how to do it. And, and you know, there's four things that we want to do as instructors in our emergency procedure to, to uh, you know, uh, to acknowledge risk and to dispel myth and to make sure everyone in the room knows what the plan is and make sure we have the equipment in place to deal with it if it were to happen in our class. And he was really like, nope, I'm not having my instructors teach people how to use a tourniquet. And I said, well, all right. I appreciate that as a choice, as a business owner, you know, your SOP like kind of trumps everything. But I said, let me throw this piece of meat into the pit. And he kind of looked at me like this. I said, you have no problem teaching people to potentially shoot somebody in the chest a bunch of time to stop them from harming somebody, but you don't really feel comfortable showing them how to put a tourniquet on someone's leg or arm to stop blood from coming out. And I said, I don't know, like maybe think about that. And he kind of gave me this puppy dog look. And, and about an hour later, he came over. He says, you know what? I've been thinking about this all wrong. He says, I, I agree with you. So he says, can you go over that tourniquet stuff again one more time? But, you know, I think any American can show another American how to use a tourniquet. Yeah. Um, from a liability standpoint, uh, you know, if you want to get certified by an organization to teach that, the USCCA's Emergency First Aid Fundamentals is a fantastic course. And then you have a patch that says you can teach tourniquet. But uh, otherwise, I know the National College of Surgeons, the Stop the Bleed, there's a, American Red Cross. There's a lot of other organizations out there that you can get a certification if that's your concern as a business owner. But I highly recommend all defensive instructors teach people how to use a tourniquet, introduce it to them, yeah. use it as a as a, as kind of like a carrot and say, hey, here's the 10,000 foot view on how to put a tourniquet on. Let me show that to you now. But do you know, we do a really comprehensive class. We run scenarios and blah, 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 and sell them on another class. Yeah. You know? I do that. I have a, an instructor that teaches the Stop the Bleed. Mm -hmm. It's a free class that we offer. So yes. when I come into my training with my students, I always have a sheet 
that tells them everything they have to do if an emergency happens. Number one, don't call the cops and tell them there's been a shootout, you know, in the rain because it's going to be a different situation. But I do have a, a trauma kit on hand and I go through everything we should do. I know a lot of instructors don't do that. Yeah, yeah I'm I think always it's like thinking ahead. Yeah. And, and from, a, from the standpoint as an instructor in a class too, you know, we have so many Americans taking classes now who uh, frankly were afraid of guns and, and even anti-gun maybe a year oh, ago. Yeah. So, you know, if I, as an instructor here, here we're in instructor development now, if, if I was an instructor and I had that Mr. And Mrs. Johnson in my class that are really still not a hundred percent sure they made the right choice in taking a class with me. And then I just flippantly say, Oh, we're all going to follow the safety rules. We're all going to be safe. Everyone's a rain safety officer, blah, blah, blah. How a lot of instructors kind of approach their classes. That really either sounds disingenuous and frankly, maybe a lie to that person, but also it, it puts a responsibility on someone that isn't ready for that responsibility. So, you know, by, by acknowledging risk and dispelling myth, you know, I can say in a class setting, gunshot wounds in a class setting is extremely rare. And I work with thousands of instructors across the country every year. And when I say, hey, how many of you guys had to call 911 in a class for a gunshot wound or have been in a class for one? And it's very rare hands go up. It's, it's very rare when that happens. Now, I'm not talking hourly clientele, RSO duty at the rate. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about classes, right? And that's what we would be doing if we're teaching one. So I let students know that. But I also will say, as rare as it is, I would be completely remiss if I didn't have a plan in place to deal with one. So now I'm acknowledging that risk. You know, even though it's less in a class, I still need to acknowledge it. So, you know, we've dispelled the myth that the, you know, I'll use my phone as the fact, so is the gun as itself is not this evil talisman that does stuff on its own. So we've dispelled that myth, but also we have to recognize we're in a class, there's human beings there and add another human being to the mix and your danger goes up exponentially because human beings are dangerous, right? So what was that about? I know. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Like that was, that was interesting. So, so anyhow, so we acknowledge that risk and then we share the plan with everyone. And then everyone feels, I think, probably a little more comfortable in your care, in your, under your leadership, but also from a practical standpoint, if we did need to put a plan in place, we've talked about it. We've documented it. I, I recommend instructors take a Sharpie marker and write it out on a piece of cardboard every time. Even though you may have a sign over there that says it, write it out because then it becomes ours. It becomes ours with the students. And we can tailor it for the needs of the day. You know, maybe you have some with an oxygen tank. That's not something that you concerned with before. So I can write on there what I need to do with that. So, you know what else I do too, just a little bit step further is I try and find out if anybody's on blood thinners. Because that mm -hmm. makes a big difference, right? So I'm like, I'm not trying to pry into your medical history, but this is important in case something were to happen. Or if you have a heart condition so that if you were to just fall out right now, I can let them know, listen, this person has a heart condition or they're on blood thinners. It speeds up the process, right? But if you don't know and something happens, you're a little bit behind. Yeah, I, I had to take a student off the line and drive him to the hospital because he had cut himself on a staple. You know, the old, ah, oh, what yeah. people said. And so he sliced himself and he's like, all right, we, he, we bandaged it up. He's, he was an adult. We all looked at, all right, it's bandaged up, but he's still in the line. He starts dripping. I'm like, Hey, yeah. are you on blood thinners or blood something? Thinners. He, says, he says, Oh yeah. I'm like, yeah. All right. Cease fire. And we got him in the car and we took him down to the, to the hospital. Yeah, so if they get a slide bite or something like that, mm -hmm. it's something pretty minor, but for a person on blood thinners, that can be pretty serious. Yeah. And how many of you guys, do you have an AED at your range? Do you carry an AED? No, not, not at our range. Ranges uh, that I've, I'm at currently have one but look yeah i i invested and bought one and you know it's an expensive investment and luckily since i bought it i have not had to use it but i've you know i've never had to and i'll knock on wood i've never had to call 911 in one of my classes for a gunshot wound yeah. i will admit there have been two occasions that i thought i was going to maybe have to call but uh you know and that's thousands of classes uh, but I've had to call a half a dozen times because of other issues. And four of those times were because of heart-related issues. Yep. You, know, you ask, like, take a poll, like, what's the number one killer of Americans, uh, you know, yep. this day and age? It's heart disease, <laughs> heart, heart problems, heart attacks. So, yeah. you know, if you just kind of look at the plausibility principle, I have a student having a heart attack is much, much more likely to happen than someone getting hurt with a firearm on, in a class. So I went ahead and purchased one. And luckily, I haven't had to use it since I carry it around. But uh, if you're interested in getting one, contact your local fire department or ambulance shed and ask them a good source on 
um, rebuilds, refurbs. Uh, sometimes there's grants available depending on your situation. And a lot of times when a city has a grant, like for instance, I, the one I got was from, in a ball field in Allegheny County and the county got a new grant to replace them all. And when they did, all of those other ones were surrendered back to the company that supplied in the first place. And he sold it to me really, really inexpensively. So uh, there are those kind of opportunities out there. Okay. Um, another question, uh, and we kind of touched on this, uh, the, these courses that are open to the ed to the people, uh, they're free to everyone involved that uh, are educating youth, aren't they? Uh, have some sort of interaction with, with youth, isn't it? Yeah, originally we did National Training to Teacher Day for specifically teachers, school staff, and administrators. But we realized we were missing out on a great opportunity. And actually, it, it really hit me hard locally when uh, the Tree of Life uh, massacre happened. And, you know, I've been working with a lot of clergy and a lot of, of churches. I'm sure all you guys have, too. You know, most of the instructors have, uh, have been doing that. And we thought, why shouldn't we open it up to churches and, and Sunday school and Cub Scouts and Anybody that works with youth in a leadership capacity is eligible to take part in this program. So that could be Sunday school people, again, clergy, churches, house of worship, uh, synagogues, what have you. Uh, it could be, you know, the, the local youth leader, you know, whatever that might be, the JCs or, or uh, what, you know, whatever organization is active in your area. Okay. Yeah, they just, so long as they work with youth in a leadership capacity, bus drivers, janitors, uh, football coach. The guy that coaches Pee Wee League, like, why not? Okay, all right, that's great. Uh, that's all the ones that I had. Crystal, you had some. Do you have the your questions with you, or do you, I need to read them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can read them. I came from the, the session. Okay, all right. So you want to read Crystal's question, yeah, sure. David? Yeah, sure. So Clint, um, could you elaborate on a specific aspect of your training program that empowers teachers to handle firearms responsibly? A and, respond, and respond effectively in emergency situations? Well, a specific, starting off with mindset to begin with, I mean, that's, that's going to lead them to get the training to be able to run the hardware, you know, if that's something that they can legally do in their, in their jurisdiction. Um, I definitely have, have seen some of the volunteers like in Ohio and a few of the other places uh, that actually allow uh, uh, teachers and school staff to carry in the building. Uh, I've seen people where, you know, they they wanted to carry, but they it wasn't part of their lifestyle yet, and they were kind of working up to it. And then finally, after hand holding and baby steps, now they're they're carrying every day. And and you know, we see this not only in in the National Training Teacher Day program, but as educators, I'm sure we all have those stories of folks that we've worked with that came to us from zero. And a lot of times they come to us from zero and the reason they want to do it is because of a negative thing that took place in their life. You know, maybe they were victimized or someone they loved was. And so they, they took on that responsibility. So I think as instructors, it's very important that we help to empower our students by helping them realize that they have it within them to do this and they are worth protecting. And, you know, it's not just, you know, their students are absolutely worth protecting, but they themselves are also worth protecting as well. And that's something that's, it's going to be a little bit of a different conversation to have with the, you know, different individuals. Uh, one of the reasons I like teaching a, a counter ambush kind of training when it comes to firearms specifically is because it takes advantage of what the body's natural reactions are likely to be based upon the limited data we have. And when you kind of explain how those work, how the fight or flight actually works and how some of those interior and exterior uh, defensive positives that show up that we have documentation on how they're designed to help people to survive. And it's instinctive, meaning that, you know, lowering center of gravity, squaring off the direction of the stimulus, you know, the hands moving protectively, like all that stuff that we see, nobody's trained to do that. It just happens because it's in our DNA. And when you explain that to folks and then they start to look in their own lives of where that actually helped them for whatever reason it may be, then they're like, oh yeah, I can do this. I don't have to be like a force recon Cav Scout Navy SEAL to be able to defend myself and my loved ones or take on this responsibility to, you know, use any tool, whatever it is to, to protect myself and others. So I think, 
approaching people from get go with like objective standards and saying, well, this is a level three kind of thing. I think that's dismissive and, and not really that terribly accurate. You know, everyone has it within them to defend themselves and, and being able to spark that fire within them, I think is the key thing. And then from there, the sky's the limit. It's just as a matter of, you know, how much someone is willing to make it part of their lifestyle choice. Did that answer the question? I think it did. Okay, good, good. I, I tend to talk circularly, so. <laughs> <laughs> so in your experience, what are the most common misconceptions or concerns teachers have when it comes to incorporating firearm training into their professional development, and how do you address them? Well, first off, I think a lot of people, again, I, I've said it a couple of times, we are not in favor of an armed teacher program, you know, like a government sanctioned or, or mandatory armed teacher thing. So that's not at all what we're about. And, and, you know, the gun is not for everybody. That's okay. Like, but every, but education is for everybody. So even if you're not into the gun, why not learn how it works? You know, learn how it operates, you know, learn how to safely make it empty so that it can't go bang. You know, like these are things that I think are important for people to understand. And that's why since its inception, I really wanted National Trainer Teacher Day to not just be about gun training, although that is a large part of it. You know, the gun is definitely the most efficient tool for self-defense uh, that mankind has available to them. I think that's, I will say that out loud, but it's not for everybody. Right. So I, that's a misconception that people think National Trainer Teacher Day is only about teaching people how to use guns. Nope, nope. Um, if you, if you choose that you don't want to have a gun near you or carry one, fine. I respect that. Like I'll help you be the, uh, an efficient whistleblower or efficient with a baseball bat, or I'll help you to be an advocate for change in your school district so that you can get funds released to put locks on the damn door. Like that's, we want to make changes, right? Right. So, yeah, it starts, you know, it, it could start potentially changes of me as a teacher or, you know, I'm speaking hypothetically, but, you know, Mrs. Johnson as the teacher in her classroom. What can she do in that environment to harden it or make it less attractive to criminals or empower herself or others to have the means to physically defend themselves? But also what can be done building wise, school district wise, community wise, state wise that can help to facilitate change for the better? Yeah. So, uh, Clint, how do you ensure that your training program aligns with legal and ethical standards? Providing That's a good question. A good question. With the knowledge and confidence to navigate the complexities of firearm use in an education setting. Well, that that is that's a how long is a piece of string question because I can't give you the answer to that specifically, but I will say specifically that it really depends on the jurisdiction. You know, and, and because our training is not just about firearms, it's about so many other things, including mindset and, and you know, making those changes to allocate resources even, um, we can navigate those waters. So uh, back in 2018, um, actually right before, right before we, we did National Train of Teacher Day, I, in response to what happened at Parkland, there was a superintendent at a Pennsylvania school district. Now, Pennsylvania, you can legally have firearms in schools. Now, that's a whole other conversation. And, and I, I will say, if you walk into a school with a firearm, you're likely to get arrested. But there is court, there's court precedent in place to where it's legal for you to have it for legal purpose. That's not what this conversation is about. But most school districts don't allow teachers in Pennsylvania to carry guns. But it would be up to the school district specifically to make that decision because we still have rifle teams and things like that in a lot of schools in Pennsylvania. So you can have guns in schools in Pennsylvania. So it might be a policy issue that, that pro prohibits that, but legally it, it still might be a thing. Now that may not be the case in every state. Obviously every jurisdiction is different. But in Pennsylvania at that time, that superintendent put buckets of rocks in every single class. He went out to the crick got big rocks and filled up five gallon buckets of rocks and put one in every single room in that school. And he was ridiculed by a lot of gun people saying, oh, you're put rocks in there, you know, but he, because of the politics of where he was and the policies of the school he was at, he was not able to arm everyone in that, in that school, which not everyone should be armed in the school. Right. You know, it's again, it's not for everybody, but everybody could pick up a rock and throw it at somebody. And I thought that that was a fantastic solution 
uh, that, that empowered people, gave them a means to defend themselves physically. You know, I think we all agree not the best means, but I tell you what, you stand there and have someone throw rocks at you and tell me what's going to happen when, with you. You know, it, it's going to disrupt what you're doing, even for an instance. Maybe it knocks the guy out, maybe not, but it now opens up other opportunities. So I, I applauded that guy. I thought that was a fantastic idea. And working within the realms of what he had to deal with politically, legally, and policy-wise, that was a fantastic proactive step. And if more people did that, I think we'd be looking at different uh, a different situation in our country here. Yeah, I can so, see, I can see yeah. where you know, somebody said, you know, look, that little kid that looked at that principal or that administrator saying, Rocks, you know, what are you talking about? And you know, just look what uh, David used against Goliath. It only took one stone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, a well-placed shot with a hard thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever that hard thing is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you're going to say something else there, Clint? before I jumped in? Oh, uh, no, I think I was done with that story. <laughs> the, the, the whole point was, you know, yeah, some states you can't carry guns in school. So what I would like for people to see, if they're in a state where you're not allowed to have a gun in the school whatsoever, but then they learn about firearms and then they learn about how they work and they dispel some of those myths and those, you know, those, those falsehoods that surround what the media teaches about that, then those folks are gonna be much better advocates for change when they talk to their local legislators and when they talk to the school board. So uh, yeah, the misconception is that a National Training Teacher Day is only about training teachers to use guns. And that's that's not true. Um, it's it's about much more than that. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions, pre-written questions we had. Crystal, did you have anything else you wanted to ask or want some information on? I don't think so. Not right now. Okay. What about you, David? I think I'm good. All right. Uh, one of, final question that I have uh, that we're asking everybody uh, after each episode is what do you do for relaxation or to de-stress from your daily activities? What do you use to do to unwind, whether it's read a book, go listen to music or whatever? What, what's your, your de-stressor? That's a good question. And, you know, I, I don't really have a great answer for that. Uh, you know, I've... <laughs> I will say that I can't function without music. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say it's always a de-stressor come down kind of thing. Although I certainly will do that. I'll, I'll sit down and put on a, you know, a concert or something, or just put, put in my buds and listen now and then, or I'll sit in front of these near fields and just listen to music. Mm -hmm. But it's something that I have to have going on or my stress goes way out the roof when I'm doing my normal stuff. So music is definitely, yeah, music is a de-stressor. I think that's a thing. I do enjoy sitting down and, and um, spending time with my child, my son. I, I do a lot of stuff with my boy, but uh, when I can sit down with him and my wife and we can, we've been binge watching Seinfeld lately. <laughs> That's been a good de-stressor. <laughs> He's old enough now to where it's appropriate. And okay. just to sit there and, and, and know what's coming up because I've seen that ep those episodes so many times and to watch the reactions on his face and, and s watch him laugh. That, that's, a, that's a pretty big distressor. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, if somebody wanted to get in contact with you or find out some more information on nat uh, National Train of Teacher Day, where would they go, Clint? All right. Well, that's an easy one. So if you want to learn more about National Train of Teacher Day, the website is nationaltrainateacherday.com. It's a lot of typing, but it's pretty easy to remember. nationaltrainateacherday.com. On there, you can connect with volunteer instructors who are offering to give away free training on June 22nd. You can contact me through the website. So if you can't find an instructor in your area, contact me and I'll do my level best to connect you with somebody. Um, also on there, there's more information. Uh, there's uh, a contact form. If there's any instructors on here that want to volunteer, they can do that too. They can, uh, they can reach me through the website. Uh, my company is Trigger Pressers Union. So TriggerPressersUnion.com is my website there. And uh, you can see all of my class I've come and I, coming up. I got a library page that links to all the different content that I put out throughout the years and through different uh, different uh, organizations and different companies. Uh, so that's where you can see my training schedule. I, I'll give you some dates here real quick. Uh, I'm going to be doing seminars at the Great American Outdoor Show in Harrisburg on February 9th, 10th, and 11th. Uh, I've got lots of dates on the Personal Defense Network training tour. Uh, the coming up this year. Uh, so 
you can find those dates on my website. I'm also hosting the, uh, well, I'm not solely hosting it, but I'm helping to host the, uh, the uh, uh, gun makers match uh, in Pittsburgh this year again. So anyone that's interested in building a firearm out of a, you know, three dimension or a 3d printer or, or something like they bring the guns there and they have a competition, which is, man, talk about innovation. Uh, I saw people make guns out of amazing things. And uh, actually one in particular, while I'll, I'll take a moment if I can, he yeah. built a recoil system using a 1022 bolt, uh -huh. but he made the recoil system out of magnets. Wow. And it was all 3d printed these tubes, but the magnets actually, you know, the positive and negative, you know how they push apart. And that was his recoil yeah. system. I, it, it was a pretty amazing. So uh, the gun makers match is coming up in April. I'll be hosting Rob Pincus for his dates on the PDN training tour. He'll be here in Pittsburgh. Uh, he's got classes all over the country as well. I'm doing a project apple seed on April 13th and 14th. Uh, I'll be at the NRA annual meeting doing seminars all three days. So you can find me there at the NRA annual meeting if you guys are coming out. Uh, so lots of stuff coming up. PDNTrainingTour.com. You can find my dates on there. I believe the website, uh, Rob announced the training tour at SHOT Show. So I think the website's being updated as we speak. Okay. Um, yeah. Lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Meet the Pressers, though. So if you guys want to find out about Meet the Pressers, uh, myself and Matt Mallory, uh, that's uh, we both uh, host that show, uh, meetthepressers.com, or find us on YouTube or all the other uh, streaming and, and podcast venues. Meet the Pressers. All right. I'll, uh, I know you sent me a picture with your schedule and everything for the year, and mm -hmm. I will put that on our website. And then whenever I do the video editing, I'll put it on the end of the, the video uh, for, for everybody to, to have access to. So. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, All right. Well, Clint, appreciate your time today. Uh, enjoyed the topic, and maybe we can come back and have you on next year or even for another topic down the road. Oh, absolutely, man. I, I, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. And, and anything you need from me, let me know. One last thing before you sign off, make sure everybody supports their local state level 2A organizations. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, it's Firearms Owners Against Crime, uh, our Institute for Legal, Legislative and Educational Action. Uh, you know, Ohio Buckeye Firearms up in Massachusetts, Gun, uh, Gun Owners Action League. So make sure you get involved with your state level 2A orgs, donate to them and volunteer and help them because they're the actual boots on the ground that are making a huge difference locally. All right. And one other thing I just remembered, uh, if, if there's instructors that have done the National Train of Teacher Day in the past and they change their curriculum or something, they just need to email you, correct? Yeah, just send me an email that like, hey, I'm teaching a different class. Can you update the website? That's That's all you need to do. And then I'll get on there and update it. Okay. All right. Sounds great. Thank you again, Clint. And uh, hope everybody has a safe day and uh, enjoy your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Right to bear is the leading self defense legal protection you can count on. If the moment comes to defend yourself or your families, Right to Bear provides the legal representation, expert witnesses, gun replacement, and even a 24-hour hotline for peace of mind exactly when you need it most. Sign up at protectwithbear.com and use promo code BTT to get 10% off. With Right to Bear you'll never defend your freedoms alone again. Join now with the promo code BTT at protectwithbear.com.